Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. Good morning. What a good, good morning to be with you guys. Man, I'm glad you're here. My name is James, senior pastor here at OCC. I hope I've had the chance to meet you. It's good to be with you here. It's good for those of you joining us online. I can't see you, though. I'm glad you can see me. We're still glad you're, you're tuning in. If you have your Bible, grab that and join me. We're jumping back. We're walking through this book, the Acts of the Apostles. And today we're in chapter 12. As we get started, I want to ask a couple questions if I can. I'm play along. This is the interactive part of do you know what a sailor's favorite letter of the alphabet is? C. Thank you very much. Because S E A C. C. I get it. Do you know what a flower's favorite letter of the alphabet is? B. Thank you very much. See, you guys know how to play this game. It's good. Everybody knows this one. What's a pirate's favorite letter of the alphabet? R. Right? Here's one you may not know. What's a convicted felon's favorite letter? Pardon letter from the governor, right? Yeah. Doesn't really fit our theme, but does help us with this passage we're going to study today in our DNA series. If you're familiar with Acts chapter 12, honestly, this is a pretty somber passage. As we read this text today, six executions are going to take place. Six different people die, they're executed. And one person, who is the most likely person at the onset to be executed, actually doesn't die. They get a pardon. They get a heavenly reprieve. So as we begin this study, the attention of the entire nation of Israel is focused on one prison cell in Jerusalem because there's a very famous prisoner in there. It's the Apostle Peter. And his only hope lies in receiving a pardon before his time runs out. And he's not waiting for a pardon letter from the governor. He's not waiting for that last second phone call. He needs God to step in. So from our perspective, and that's the title of the sermon today, when we look at the circumstances on paper, here at the beginning, things look really, really bleak for Peter, and they look really rosy for the king at the time, a guy named King Herod. And by the time we get to the end of this chapter, the perspective is going to flip. And that's going to occur through six scenes that happen in this passage. If you grabbed your outline on the way in, I hope you got one of those. There's six scenes, all that begin with the letter R. I'm going to start out with Herod's resolve. And we're going to see Peter's rescue, and there's a glorious reunion. It's kind of comical. Then the ramifications of Peter's rescue, and then we're going to see the retaliation for Herod's action, and it ends with the glorious result of this story. So six outline points, and what's Pastor James' favorite letter? R. Right? They all start with R. And we're going to start with King Herod's resolve. And his resolve, literally, is to see the apostle Peter put to death. If you don't have an outline in your Bible with you, join me here. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, now do you remember where we last left at the end of chapter 11? This is the time that Saul and Barnabas are bringing a bunch of money from the church in Antioch over to Judea. They're actually going to learn. We learn from correlation. They bring it to a church in Jerusalem. It's that time that this is happening. Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belong to the church. Not just hands. He's not shaking hands. These are violent hands, right? Now, for clarity, there's a bunch of Herods mentioned in the Bible. Which one is this? This is King Herod Agrippa. Here's the king over Judea at this time. God allowed this really wicked man to rule from 37 AD to 44 AD. And he's in the family line of all these horrible Herods that you hear about. His grandfather was Herod the Great. And Herod the Great is probably most famous for killing all the babies when Jesus was born. Remember trying to to wipe out the Messiah. And this Herod has an uncle. He's named Herod Antipas. He was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded in prison. You remember that? So all these Herods, they're like this mafia family. They're prone to violence. And we encounter this Herod, and he's trying to curry favor with the Jews. He's trying to gain support from the Jewish people. He takes this survey. He finds out nine out of ten Jews don't like what's happening in the church. They don't like the way the Christian church is growing, right? Right? And so what Herod does is he starts arresting church members and he starts mistreating them and much worse. Verse 2, Herod killed James, killed the brother of John. How did he do it? With the sword. So here's the first of the six executions 
that occur in this passage. We talked about James a little bit last week when we looked at all the disciples. We know he's the brother of John. He's one of the sons of thunder, right? But he was also part of the close circle of three guys that Jesus hung out with all the time. It was Peter, James, and John. Those are the guys who went up with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Those are the guys who were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is Jesus' closest friend. And here, this tragedy happens. He's the first of the 12 apostles to be martyred. And besides Judas Iscariot, James is the only one whose death is actually recorded in Scripture. If you want to study the deaths of the other apostles, and I will warn you, it's a pretty grisly study. You have to do some outside research. You have to do some extra biblical support. And you'll see all those guys go through some pretty grisly murders, and James does as well. Because that's the notion here. It says in the text, he's put to death with the sword, back in Jesus' day, that meant they literally cut his head off. He was beheaded. Verse 3, when King Herod Agrippa saw that it pleased the Jews, what pleased the Jews? That James's head was cut off. How bad off are these people? They loved that, right? So Herod proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. So Herod gets up the next morning and he gets online and he's reading all the news headlines and he says, wow, what do you know? These people actually liked it that I killed James. You know what I'll do next? I'll go arrest Peter. They're going to love that, right? He's the leader of the pack. Jewish people are going to think this is great. And you got to remember the overall context here because James' martyrdom is really significant because it indicates a change in the motivation for why persecution was occurring. And we've studied this all along. There was tons of persecution for the early church, and it was led by who? Saul, who is at this present moment carrying relief funds from Antioch. He's changed. God changed him on the Damascus Road. He's all in now, right? But he originally was persecuting the church, and it was over religious reasons. He was wrong, but, but he sincerely believed the best way to worship the Lord was legalistically, right? And so he persecuted the church for religious reasons. But now what we see is the shift and all the persecution is coming politically. Now it's political persecution. So there's there's a change in the motivation behind the persecution. But there's also a change in the attitude of the Jewish population, certainly of the Jewish church, right? If you remember back when we studied Acts chapter 4, the Jewish leaders didn't punish the apostles back then. They ended up getting thrown in jail, but but the church was overwhelmingly behind them, right? The Jewish folks, the apostles didn't get persecuted because the church was behind them, because the church was popular back in the day. Well, what has happened here? Here in chapter 12, the Jewish people are pleased that James got beheaded. What was the big change between Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 12? We remember this is what we've talked about the last several weeks. The church is changing. Back in Acts chapter 4, it was just Jewish. And now, what is it? It's inclusive. Now there's a whole bunch of people there who are Gentile people, and a lot of the the Jewish people did not like this new all-inclusive church. And they're willing to kill people over it. Verse 4. When Herod had seized Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Now, the reality is, Herod would have likely killed Peter as soon as he apprehended him, but according to God's sovereignty, he actually did that during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so Herod pulls back on the reins. He's like, even the people who hate the church are going to think, if I kill one of the apostles during this feast, Herod, you might have gone too far, right? So that could be the motivation. It could also be, and this is even more morbid to think, the people who would want to see Peter beheaded would have lots of responsibilities during the feast. They'd have a lot of stuff going on, and those guys would hate to be conducting something and miss Peter being beheaded, right? As morbid as that is. So so Herod holds off. He doesn't carry out his plan, but he's going to, right, at the end of this feast. Wants to kind of recreate the scene we saw with Pontius Pilate when he brought Jesus and Barabbas out. Do you remember that? And he gave the crowd a choice. What do you want to do? And they said, free Barabbas. What should we do with this guy, Jesus? Crucify him. Herod's sure if he brings Peter out in front of the people because of the fact that they liked seeing James killed, they're going to go thumbs down for Peter. And he's going to be done, right? He's just certain of that. He's resolved to kill Peter. And so that leads to our second point. Peter needs to be rescued. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison... But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. What kind of prayer? Earnest prayer. 
That's a neat Greek word, ektenes. It means fervent, right? I don't want this to escape our radar. Basically, the entire story switches right here. Verse 5 is the key because the prayer is the thing that unleashes God's power. Herod has stuff, right? He has guards. He has prison. The church has the power of prayer. And it's fervent prayer, ectenes. It's the same word we see when Jesus is praying. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he's praying fervently and he sweats, what? Great drops of blood. It's anguished prayer. It's that kind of prayer. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to participate or to be carried along by prayer like that. I, 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 like I wish you have, but then I almost don't wish you have because if it's happened, you're in the middle of a severe trial. I guarantee it. But I've had that blessing. Christina and I have literally been carried by prayer. It's that kind of prayer that they're talking about here. It's not the kind of prayer like, well, gosh, if we just prayed a little harder, we could change God's mind. If I just pray a little harder, maybe get some sweat to come out, then, then I could swing the balance. No, prayer doesn't change God's mind. What we have to remember is God answers prayer all the time according to his plan, according to his purpose. I think sometimes we pray and we think, well, God's just reluctant to act, like he's waiting on us to pray harder. No, that's not the case. God is caring and compassionate all the time. He answers prayer all the time. I do believe there are some times where he is trying to help us. He is delaying the answer to the prayer so that we will be a little more on board, a little more fervent in our prayer so that our heart will match his. I think that's what he's wanting for us. I didn't sing today in, in worship. My, I lost my voice a couple days ago, and I'm, God's answered my prayer today <laughs> to be standing up here talking. But, but in that, like sometimes I, I absolutely love worship and song, and there are sometimes I don't sing because literally the words are too powerful for me to sing. I'm like, if I can't do that, I'm not going to sing that I'm going to do that. Have you ever experienced that? There's a couple worship songs over the last couple decades that, that I've really struggled with, and there's a Brandon Heath song I remember, and the, the, one of the lyrics is literally, give me your eyes. Give me eyes to see people, Jesus, like you see people. Do I really mean that? <laughs> do I really want that? There's a song, I think it was by Hillsong, crushed me several years ago. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Really? Do we want that? Because that's a burden. But that's what God wants for us. So sometimes I think he's, he's slowing the answer to prayer so that we'll be on board. God, do I see people the way you see people? Do I love people the way you love people? Those are serious prayers. So here the early church is together. They're fervently praying for Peter's rescue and fervently like they keep it up. There's a whole week of this feast and they're praying day and night the week of this feast. Verse six. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, so that means the feast has ended, right? On that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Now, this lets us know Herod knows what happened last time Peter was in prison, right? He knows that he got busted out by an angel, so he's taking nothing for granted here. He assigns four squads of soldiers with four guys each in a squad, and they're working six-hour shifts. So they're basically maximum security, 24-7 guarding Peter. He's got 16 guys doing this job. Two guys standing out in front of whatever cell Peter was in. Two guys literally in the cell, laying on the floor with him, chained to him. One to each of his wrists, right? And this is pretty, pretty serious. Peter's on double secret probation. And this is his last night in jail. We're going to haul him up off the concrete floor and present him to the masses so he can have his head cut off. Now, just thinking about those circumstances, where Peter is, do you think Peter should be a little more anxious than it appears <laughs> that he is in the cell? If this was you and me, what would we be doing? I'd be trying to pick that lock. Right? I, I'd be trying to Andy Dufresne and Shawshank Redemption, you know, tunnel my way somehow out of this prison. Peter's not doing that at all. He's sleeping. I love that. Verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell, and that didn't wake him up. So the angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. This much is pretty clear. Peter's not worried, right? He's sleeping so soundly, the angel has to come along and say, dude, come on, get up. 
You're sleeping like a rock. Get it? Because that's Peter's nickname. Sorry, anyways. <laughs> but, but this begs the question, why is Peter so calm here? From what I said earlier about being literally carried by the power of prayer, Peter knows folks are praying for him. And we can be practical. Peter's been in jail recently, and what happened? An angel busted him out, so he's probably thinking, no big deal. I'm going to have an angel bust me out again. But there's another thing, if we correlate Scripture, that I think actually is the thing that allows Peter to be so calm here. It's because Peter knows he's not going to die. Not at this time, right? Right? I don't know if you remember this or not, in John chapter 21, after Peter is kind of reinstated to ministry, you remember Peter denied Jesus three times, so he goes and meets with Jesus, and Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter gets reinstated to ministry. He says, well, if you love me, then do what? Go feed my sheep. Right after that passage, Jesus tells Peter how and when he's going to die. Do you remember that? It's in John 21, verse 18. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, when you were young, You used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is Jesus telling Peter how he's going to die. He says, you're going to be old and you're going to be crucified. That's literally what stretching out your hands means. So Peter's sitting here in prison and he goes, well, I'm not old. (laughs) And they killed James with the sword and so I'm not worried about that sword. That's not how I'm planning on dying, right? So he's got this incredible calm. He's sound asleep on death row. There's still some really cool angel ministry that happens here. Acts 12, verse 8. The angel said to him, Peter, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And the angel said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. I don't know what happens here. Like the angel shows up and puts the sleeper hold on the four guards and they go to sleep. or Drops some pixie. I don't know how angels put to sleep. But, but he does that, right? The angel shows up and puts these guards to sleep and he springs the locks and then he makes Peter put on his own shoes. I love that. There's so many cool miracles in the Bible that happen where God does something miraculous and we still have to do something really ordinary, right? Like we have to play part. This happened at the feeding of the multitudes. Remember, Jesus takes a little kid's sack lunch, blows it up. There's food for 20,000 people, but he makes the disciples go bust all the leftovers, right? (laughs) Do you remember when he raises Lazarus from the dead? And Lazarus is in the tomb, and literally he rises up. There's a bunch of guys standing around there, and Jesus says, you guys go roll the stone away. Jesus could have done that too, right? (laughs) If he can bring somebody back to life, he can certainly roll the stone away. But there's a part we're supposed to play in the miracles. There's a part that we are responsible for. That's how we join him in his work. Amen? Verse 9. And Peter went out and he followed the angel. I love this. Peter did not know what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. If you have a junior high kid, this has happened to you a zillion times. You go up to wake up your junior high kid because they slept through the alarm 16 times. And, and, and you turn on the light in the room they don't wake up. So what do you do? Bang. <laughs> you bang them. You're like, put on your clothes and follow me. And they put on their clothes and they come down to breakfast. They might go all the way to school and they're sleepwalking. They're not awake yet. <laughs> they have no clue what's going on. That's what's happening to Peter here. And the text says Peter thought he saw a vision. And we can give Peter a little bit of a pass on this because what happened just a couple chapters earlier in Acts chapter 10? He saw a vision. The meat sheet wasn't real, right? He saw this vision of a thing that looked like a meat sheet. And so I'm giving Peter a little bit of a pass here, but he's now in this, right? This is happening. Verse 10, when they passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. You ready for this? It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left Peter. Now this is really cool, and I don't know if you noticed this. This is when God invented the motion sensor. Because they walked up. No, but it's either that or it's another miracle, right? Because the iron gate to the city would have required many men to open. And they walk up to it and it opens of its own accord. But there's something I think is more cool for our application in this. And it's the fact that Peter and the angel went to the gate while it was still closed. And then God opened it. Do we do that? Or when God asks us to join him, sometimes we look real, real far in the distance and we go, no, God, there's a closed gate way out there. There's a closed door way out there, so I can't start on this journey with you because that door is closed. And what God is wanting us to do is just join him a step at a time. (laughs) We join him along on the journey, and then when we get to that gate, if he wants to open it, don't we know that he can open it? He's the one who opens gates. He's the one who opens doors. We just join him step by step by step. That way we know he's the one who gets the glory because he is the one who is worthy. He'll open any gate that is the best for us. 
for our abundance. Verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he finally snaps out of his sleepwalking. He says, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and, Peter's aware, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. What were the Jewish people expecting? Boom, we're going to lop Peter's head off, right? Just like happened to the Apostle James. Peter kind of comes to his senses. He realizes he's being rescued by the angel. He realizes he has a part to play in that. And now his part is, man, I'm standing out on the street, and I'm an escaped convict. (laughs) I'm a felon. I probably shouldn't just be standing out here going, wee, because the guards will come and arrest me, right? So he's going to go find a place to hide. Leads to the third point on our outline. We're going to see a funny reunion. Verse 12. When Peter realized this, that he'd been rescued, he went to the house of Mary. Now, Mary was the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered and they were praying. Again, this is where Peter is different from me. If this happens to me, I get out of Dodge immediately, right? I I leave Jerusalem that moment. Peter goes, no, i got to go check in with these people who are lifting me up, carrying me by the power of prayer. And they're meeting at this lady named Mary's house. Now, Mary is the mother of John Mark, and we're going to be introduced to John Mark in more detail next week because if you remember, he went along with Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey. John Mark, kind of important in the Bible. He's also the human author of the Gospel of Mark. But his mother is also kind of a big shot, and apparently she's got a pretty big house because she's hosting this huge prayer meeting, and she must be kind of well off. She has servants. We actually see that in the next verse. Verse 13. And when Peter knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. So before she got her big break on the Mary Tyler Moore show and then got her own sitcom in the 70s, you younger people just lost it there. There was a lady named Rhoda who was a servant at Mary's house. She's the one who goes to that locked door when Peter shows up, okay? Now, no surprise at all that the door would be locked in the middle of the night. Number one, it's the middle of the night, and it's just wise to lock your door. But number two, what is Herod doing right now? He's throwing violent hands at Christians. And so if you're a Christian, it's a real good idea to lock your door. And if somebody knocks on your door in the middle of the night, you're not just going to throw it up and go, hey, who's there, right? You're going to have a little more guarded attitude. And that's what happens here with Rhoda, right? Peter rings the bell or knocks at the gate or whatever, and she goes out there, and she doesn't fling the door open. She goes, hey, who's there? And Peter goes, hey, it's me, right? Verse 14, recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, Rhoda did not open the gate, (laughs) but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Now, again, this is so cool because this really happened. And, and maybe this has happened to you before. You were doing something and you got so excited about something that you forgot to do the thing you're actually supposed to do, right? She gets flustered. She hears Peter's voice. She's going to recognize Peter's voice. He was a very recognizable apostle. And she's a servant there at Mary's house. So she's been there the whole week and she knows what they're praying about, Right? Even if she's not part of the prayer circle, she's heard what they're praying about. They're praying for Peter to be released. They're praying for Peter to be delivered from prison. And now here she goes to the door and she hears Peter's voice. And so she runs to the prayer circle and she goes, guess what, guys? This is amazing. You're never going to believe who's standing outside. It's Peter. Verse 15, they said to her, you are out of your mind. (laughs) Now that's not nice. It's just not a nice response at all. They say, Rhoda, you're crazy. What were they earnestly praying for? For Peter to get out of prison. They've been praying for days about that one thing, that one thing only. And Rhoda goes to tell them about it, and they're like, we're busy praying for Peter to be released. And she's like, um, uh, see, what happened was, <laughs> yeah, like, you, you don't understand. I got something I really got to tell you, right? God can bust Peter out of jail. Peter can't break himself into a prayer meeting. It's kind of funny. Mary's prayer circle thinks Rhoda has lost it, right? Look at the rest of verse 15. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I will confess that for sure. We don't have a bunch of time to spend on it now. I'll make sure we address it in midpoint. But in that, does Peter have his own personal guardian angel? Right? He's been busted out of prison twice by an angel, Here they call it Peter's angel to say it's his angel. Does he have a guardian angel? Do you have one? Do I have one? I think that's a fun question to discuss. Again, we'll do that in the podcast. There's a more practical question that comes from the text. What are these praying folks thinking? 
All they're praying for is Peter's release. Now he's literally at the front door and they don't even think for a second that he could be standing outside. I'm really surprised Luke doesn't throw in a ye of little faith reference here, but, but praise the Lord, either it's getting really cold outside or Peter's like, the guards are coming by. He just keeps knocking, right? He is persistent. And verse 16, when they opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. Now, I love the plural pronouns there because doesn't that really give you the picture that this whole prayer circle got up and walked to the door? <laughs> like, well, let's go see what's going on. Ro- Ro- what is Rhoda talking about? And Peter's there. And they freak out, right? Like they spend a moment, you know, with just their jaws dropped because God answered this prayer. And then they must get kind of loud, right? They must get just a little bit boisterous because now Peter has to tell them, verse 17, motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He's like, it's the middle of the night (laughs) and I'm an escaped convict. Could you guys keep it down? Let me tell you what actually happened here. And he tells this incredible story about the angels and the escape, whatever, this, this jailbreak that he slept through. And then he says this, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Now this is not, Peter's not lost it himself. This is not a reference to James who just got beheaded, right? This is a different James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who was actually the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And so Peter's saying, tell him, tell all the other brothers about this incredible thing that God has done. Now, this tells us a couple things. Number one, James and the other leaders of the church are not at this prayer meeting, nor do they have to be. You guys can have a lovely prayer meeting without me there. That's the beautiful thing about being a follower of Christ. You don't need somebody to intercede for you. (laughs) You just go hang out and talk with the Lord on your own. That's fantastic, right? But the other thing is, James and the brothers, they might have been having their own prayer meetings somewhere else because they were hiding too. They knew what Herod was up to, and and they're they're taking care of themselves in that regard. But I think it's beautiful that the prayer meeting went on without the disciples and the leaders there. And, And so it says Peter is planning to go to another place. I don't know where that is. Maybe he's going to go try and find out where James and the, and the brothers are. But I think this is so neat. Do you remember where the Lord instructed Peter to go in Acts chapter 5 when he got busted out of prison? He got arrested for preaching in the temple and he gets busted out and they're like, go right back and start preaching again. But it doesn't happen here. He gets different marching orders. Peter's supposed to leave Jerusalem entirely, put them in his rear view mirror. And, and honestly, this is a neat transition point here in Acts. This is what we've been building to for weeks. We've seen the the focus switch from Jewish people to Gentile people. We saw the focus switch from the church in Jerusalem to the church in Antioch and now beyond. And now, between these two chapters, we're going to see the focus switch from studying Peter and his ministry to studying Paul and his ministry. So big, big change here for us. But Peter is not done with ministry. Ministry is in his DNA, and we're going to see Peter again for sure. We'll see him in this study because he shows back up in Jerusalem. He's that bold in Acts chapter 15. We'll see him there. If you read some of the other accounts of the early church, in Galatians chapter 2, we see that Peter was in Antioch. If you read the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, do you remember that big debate? Peter had obviously been around teaching other places because in in Corinth, they were arguing over which teacher they liked best. Do you remember that? Some liked Apollos, some liked Paul, and some liked our old boy Peter. So he's not done with ministry, right? He's just able to get out of this situation where Herod was resolved to kill him and where God rescued him. And then he has his little reunion with the prayer team. And that leads to the fourth point on our outline, the ramifications. Ramifications just means broader effects. It means the consequences of God's actions here. But consequences didn't start with an R. So ramifications it is, right? Verse 18, now when day came, This is one of the greatest duh verses in the whole Bible. There was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. I mentioned Shawshank Redemption earlier. Do you remember that scene when Andy Dufresne is gone and and the warden comes to look and and it's like the guy had vanished because he literally kind of had? The soldiers here having that same thing. Like, man, we put Peter in there and he was chained to some other guys and then we came back and he's gone. And that's going to be something that people are going to notice. And and the guards know that King Herod's going to find out pretty quickly. Verse 19. And after Herod searched for Peter and did not find him, King Herod examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. What that examination looked like, right? 
The, the guards are looking for Peter. It's like he's vanished in the wind. Herod's looking for Peter. He goes up to these soldiers, and I don't know how this went, but he's like, do you guys see anything? Nope. You see anything? Nope. What about you two guys who were literally chained to him? Like, I noticed you still have the chains on your wrists, but there's nothing at the other end. Did you see anything? Nope. You guys are going to die. Right? That's what Herod comes up with, because there's really only one of two thoughts there. And the first one Herod's rooting for, this is an inside job. You guys somehow let him go, right? That's the one he's really rooting for, because what's the other option? God did a miracle. And Herod didn't go down that road, even though he had assigned 16 guards because he knew God could do it. Herod didn't want that to be the case, right? And so what does he do? Four more executions. That's five executions now here in Acts chapter 12. There are ramifications of this. Our actions have consequences. We talk about this all the time. What do you think one of the consequences is here? Any Christ follower who now gets thrown in prison, no guard's going to want to watch him. Because if God does that cool thing and and breaks them out by an angel, they know they're going to die. There are ramifications here for sure. Leads us to our next point, fifth on your outline. We see the retaliation from God. The rest of verse 19. Then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea, and he spent time there. Herod is so disgusted, he's so upset that he leaves town. He gets out of Jerusalem, and he goes to his headquarters. He had a big area that he reigned over in Caesarea. And I want to take a look at the map real quick so we can see where this is. This is a map of Paul's journeys, but it shows the areas that I want us to see real clearly. Down here at the bottom is Judea, Jerusalem, where Peter gets sprung out of prison. And Herod leaves there, and he follows that red dotted line over there up to Caesarea, right there on the Mediterranean coast. And then there's a couple towns I want you to notice. They're about 60 miles north, Tyre and Sidon, up in that Syria area. That's not under Herod's control. That's the area of Phoenicia. But it turns out they play an important part in the next part of this story. King Herod leaves Jerusalem, and he heads there, verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace. Why did they want peace? Herod was so mad that he put an economic embargo on them and they wouldn't let them have food. He wouldn't let them have grain, says in the rest of that verse. Their country depended on Herod's country for food. So that's what we saw on the map. Those Tyre and Sidon, those cities up there, those are commercial seaports. And so there's lots of traffic in and out of there. And Herod finds a way to deny them grain, right? They relied on the Palestinian area for their grain. Herod cuts off their food supply. And so the citizens of Phoenicia somehow go and cozy up with this guy Blastus. We don't get all the details in Scripture. I'm assuming they paid him off. That would be the easiest way to cozy up to him. But they need a guy who's on the inside to ask Herod to lift this embargo. So I don't think Blastus wants this job either, but I guess he takes the money, and he passes along this appeal for peace from the Phoenicians. And what's Herod's response? He's going to put on a little show. He's going to gather a bunch of people together and show just how important he is, right? He's going to show off his majesty. Verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes. He took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. Herod is a guy who likes to hear himself talk. Now, if you'll do some research, there's a Jewish historian named Josephus, and and the stuff he has written really helps put together a lot of the things that happen in the Bible. And Josephus says that this appointed day was most likely a day that had already been scheduled to honor someone else, to honor the Roman emperor Claudius. But Herod didn't like that idea. He didn't want anybody else getting more attention than him, right? So as he put it on his royal robes, And what Josephus says is these robes weren't purple, which a lot of the color of majesty was back then. Herod had his silver. He made his sewn with silver in there. He probably looked like the tin man. But but the idea was if he would ever go sit on the throne at a certain time of day when the sun was coming up, the sun would shine on his royal robes, and it would be so brilliant that people couldn't even look at him, right? And that's what he wanted. He wanted people to be like, oh, my gosh, Herod is so magnificent, I can't even look at him, right? He just wants to be a spectacle, He wants people to say nice things about him. And these folks really want to say nice things about him because they want their food back, right? So they oblige, verse 22. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. You ever heard a speech that good? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, me neither. (laughs) I don't really think that's the case here whatsoever. Herod's not the world's most interesting man. These people just want to eat. 
They want Herod to lift this embargo. So they line up to kiss his ring, right? They flatter him. And Herod really likes that. You know who doesn't like that? The one true God. The king of glory. The God who is worthy of our glory. I want us to understand on this because I've got to be so clear. God's not like a glory hog. God isn't trying to, to swoop up glory that's not his. It's just that everything that is glorious comes from him. And so if something tries to claim glory that's not theirs, that comes from God, we call that false glory. God's not a big fan of that at all, right? You know who was? Herod. He wanted all that glory. So what happened? Verse 23. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck Herod down. Why? Because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. If you're keeping score, Herod is the sixth and final person to be executed in chapter 12. And it occurred at the peak of his ego trip. People were calling him a God and not a man, and God strikes him down. And I love that Luke throws in this detail that Herod got buried just like a guy would, right? <laughs> just like a man. Because what happens when we die? These bodies, these old flesh cartons, they get put in the ground, as gross as this might be, and we become worm food. These bodies decompose. We're not going to need them in heaven, right? And so Luke includes that detail because Herod exalted himself so highly. James was beheaded at the beginning of this chapter. Why? Because he gave God the glory because he was obedient to join God, right? Herod is executed. Why? Because he won't give God the glory. Isn't this the picture we see in Scripture? If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. If you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. King Herod for sure gets humbled. God retaliated when Herod claimed false glory. But that leads to a glorious result. This is the last point on your outline. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Amen? That's what happens. God gets the glory because he's worthy of the glory. At the beginning of chapter 12, do you remember it looked like Herod was winning and Peter was losing. He was going to be killed for sure. But what happened throughout chapter 12, our perspective changed. God literally presses pause and he points at the scoreboard and he says, like, well, Herod is worm food and Peter's still doing his ministry. He's, he's displaying his DNA. And the church is growing because it's unstoppable. If you have your outline, I want to wrap this up. Three real quick takeaways. We don't have a bunch of time to spend on these, but, but these are all so apparent in this text. And the first is this. God is sovereign all the time, and we are not. God does a lot of things that we just can't explain. I don't know why James gets busted out of jail in Acts chapter 5, and then he's beheaded here in chapter 12. I wish I knew, but I really don't. There, there are some weird things in this passage. There's 16 soldiers assigned to guard Peter. Four of them die. Twelve of them don't. Why were those four guys on guard when Peter gets let out of prison? I don't know the answer to that. But God does. Because God is sovereign. And here's the thing I've learned over now three decades, almost to following the Lord. I'm not going to get all the answers. God has all the answers. So what am I going to do? Fight with him over the fact that I can't understand it or trust him? Because he's worthy of my trust and everything that I see in God's word and everything that I see in my life, he's worthy of that trust. God's sovereign all the time. I don't know things God does. I just trust he's up to the thing that's going to bring him the most glory and if I am obedient, it's going to give me the most abundance in this life. That's where I've landed. Second quick takeaway, God answers prayer all the time. He may not answer it the way we like. He may not answer it in the timetable that we like, but he answers prayer all the time. And that is certainly on display here. There's a great quote I love from, a, from an old, old Puritan preacher named Thomas White about the story. White said, the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel, <laughs> right? That's the part that we can play. God answers prayer all the time. Third point is where we got the title for the sermon today. God has the best perspective. Remember, at the beginning of this story, Peter's on death row. Herod's on top of the world. At the end of the story, it's flopped. Peter's still displaying his DNA for ministry. Herod's worm food. God sees things better than we do. 
His perspective is always better than ours. He can see the whole playing field. And because of that, he does allow trials in our lives. We get this, right? He allows the trials because he's sovereign. He allows the trials because he answers prayer, and he'd love to see us fervently praying to see things the way he sees them. And when we understand his perspective is better than ours, he understands what's going to bring him the glory he's worthy of. He understands the thing that's going to lead to abundance for us. Maybe we can live like Peter. We'll, we'll literally be in prison, chained to guards, and be able to take a nap because we're just not concerned. We know that God has got this. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. I sure do love you. Let's pray. Father God, help us to do that. Help, help us to pray fervently for your will to be done and not ours. Help us to pray to see people the way you see people. Help us to pray to love people the way you love people. Help us to pray to join you where you're in work, where you get the glory, and and then because of your great love for us, you'll give us the most abundance we can possibly have because we will rest in you. God, help us to learn from Peter in this passage and live lives that look just like his. God, we love you and we praise you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast, as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care, and God bless.